Alive's app to use near me. 11 Alive News at 11 p.m. is where you find out what's happening now across Metro Atlanta. We begin tonight with breaking news out of Cobb County where a neighborhood is now. Where you stay a step ahead of severe weather. Our storm risk has now been upgraded to a... And the only place where you can verify fact versus fiction. 11 Alive can verify that claim is false. 11 Alive News at 11 p.m. Where you end the day ready to take on tomorrow. Weather can't run from the 11 Alive Thunder Truck. A mobile weather center with the power and speed to chase down the strongest storms and bring you on the ground conditions. The 11 Alive Thunder Truck, sponsored by Landmark Dodge. Fighting social inequality is on all of us. That's why 11 Alive is committed to sharing diverse perspectives, exposing injustice, and finding solutions. Voices for Equality, sponsored by Georgia Power and our other partners. The 11 Alive Storm Trackers. It's how you see weather happening now across Metro Atlanta. These severe storms are now closing in. We could be talking about damaging winds, hail, and... How you can plan ahead by knowing what's coming overhead. Heavy storms are rolling in. Expect pop-up thunderstorms and rain all day long. And how you be weather ready wherever you are. We expect at any moment a tornado warning could be issued. The 11 Alive Storm Trackers. It's how you'll be prepared and stay safe. 11 Alive Morning News. We began with breaking news this morning. Is where you know what's happening uh, 11, now. 11 Alive is live on the scene. Where you can confidently plan ahead. This severe weather is intensifying. By knowing what's coming overhead. And we're Atlanta's traffic expert. We've seen delays almost 30 minutes worth of time. Helps you get there on time. Every time. 11 Alive Morning News is where you start the day prepared. Watch weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m. If you see breaking news or severe weather news, Timothy Miller. I think you should give him a big hand. He is a much sought after performer with that beautiful voice, a native of Augusta, Georgia. He is widely recognized for his stirring renditions of God Bless America during the seventh inning stretch of the Atlanta Braves home games. He's a featured artist with the Atlanta Opera, the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra, and the Georgia Symphony Orchestra. He has been a soloist for a number of inaugural ceremonies, including the two for Governor Nathan Deal. And uh, he has become widely known, much appreciated, and we're so happy to have him here today. By the way, he is also the Assistant Professor of Voice at Morehouse College and is on the board of the Meridian Herald. Mr. Miller, thank you very much for being here today. Now, I want to say that this service is not a worship service like at the church. Um, you can clap, you can, I mean, don't talk back or anything, but you can, <laughs> you can enjoy yourself in a, in a very laid back way today. That's what it's meant to be because Sandra made everybody feel so welcome, always. And we want everybody here to feel that way today. Speaking of welcome, a very special welcome right now to the Governor and First Lady Marty Kemp. We are honored by your presence with us here today. Where is the Governor? Right here, right here in front of me. Thank you for being here. It's an honor to have you with us.
We have someone now who's going to lead us in prayer. I own Avery Niles. Avery, will you come on up? Avery led the Department of Juvenile Justice for the Deal Administration. But I'm not going to say too much about him coming up here today because everybody here knows Avery Niles and loves him and deeply appreciates him. Avery, thank you. Thank you much. Let the church say amen. amen. Come on now, better than that. Amen. Good, good, good. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, we're grateful to know that through the sacrifices of your son, Jesus, death is merely the beginning and not the end. Please give Miss Deal her rest from her labor. I pray that her life will be inspirational to the living and to, that she may rest peacefully in your kingdom. Father God, we know that time is too slow for those who wait. It's too swift for those who fear. It's too long for those who grieve. And it's too short for those who rejoice. But for those who love, time is eternity. I know that these three remain faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Father, thank you for the love that Miss Deal have shown to her family, to this state, and our nation. Father, please wrap your long loving arms around Governor Deal and his family. I pray that you give him peace in which he deserves. Give this family hope for tomorrow. You are our God. You are our King. You are our strength. You are the bright light in our darkest hour. Please be with us and keep us in your care. In Christ Jesus' name, amen. After a beautiful memorial service this morning at First Baptist Church, we've now had the perfect beginning in music and prayer for this gathering this afternoon, which has one sole purpose. That's to give thanks for and celebrate the life of Sandra Deal, the beloved First Lady of Georgia. She was a daughter, a sister, a wife, a mother, she was a champion educator, a faithful Christian in every way, and a model citizen. And she was friend to more people than she could count. If you met her, you became her friend. I have loved every visit to Nathan and Sandra's home. And Nathan, I want to thank you for allowing me this privilege today. I was their pastor for 20 years at First Baptist. So I've been in their homes numerous times, in the office in Washington and elsewhere. So whether it was at Claremont, or on Nopone Road, or in the Governor's Mansion, or on the Chattahoochee River in Habersham County, where in the kitchen window, Sandra kept something hanging there. I have it in my pocket. Did you know I'd swipe this from your house? <laughs> Here it is. It's a cross that was always in the window there at the house, probably before this one. And it quotes Proverbs 31, verse 25. Listen to this. She is clothed in strength and dignity, and she laughs without fear of the future. That's Sandra Deal. And by the way, I'm going to give this back to you. So don't worry, I, I won't take it. I won't take it home with me. But that's a good introduction to a text I want to read today. And it is from Proverbs 31. You've heard this before. You've heard this read at the funeral of numerous women, no doubt. But you could put Sandra Dill's picture by this passage. She epitomizes it. 
A wife of noble character, who can find? She is worth far more than precious rubies. Her husband has full confidence in her and lacks nothing of value. She brings him good and not harm all the days of her life. And by the way, she brought an awful lot of good into your life, Nathan, in many ways, and you into hers. She works with eager hands. She gets up while it is still dark, providing for her family. She sets about her work vigorously. Her arms are strong for the task. And then listen to this portion. Is this not Sandra? She opens her arms to the poor and extends her hands to the needy. And when it snows, she has no fear for her household, for all of them are clothed in scarlet. Her husband is respected at the city gate, where he takes his seat among the elders of the land. She is clothed with strength and dignity, and she can laugh at the days to come. She speaks with wisdom, and faithful instruction is on her tongue. She watches over the business of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children arise and call her blessed. Her husband also, he praises her, saying, Many women do noble things, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceptive, beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her the reward she has earned, and let her work bring her praise at the city gate. Let her work bring, bring her praise in the Ramsey Conference Center. That's what we're going to do today. We're going to give praise to this woman who meant so much to everybody in this state. So this is Sandra Deal. And by the way, it's, it's my thinking that behind every great governor, there is a great governor's spouse. Especially if the governor is an introvert, <laughs> and the spouse is about as extroverted as they come. I mean, total opposites. I, I was riding up the road the other day, going to Nathan's house, and Political Rewind was on. Now, Political Rewind is not always real nice to governors and, you know, people in power. Um, but this was especially moving because Bill Nigel said, we're going to take the last 15 minutes and talk about Sandra Deal. And it was the most beautiful tribute I think I've ever heard. And he talked about, I think it was Greg Bluestein he was quoting. Or maybe, maybe Greg Bluestein on the panel is the one who said it. But one of them said, you know, when, when they were first in the campaign for governor the first time, They'd go from place to place, you know, how you do that and meet with people and eat with them and greet them and so forth. And Greg Bluestein said it was so interesting. Nathan Deal would go down the line, get his plate and go over to the table and sit down by himself. And Sandra would come over and say, Nathan, these people are here to see you. Let's go over there and talk to them. That was Sandra Deal. I especially love two things about Sandra. She approached the poorest janitor in any building in the very same way she approached the President of the United States. She made no distinction as to a person's place in life. And whether the janitor or the President, it was the same. She met them with a great smile and a plentiful goodwill in her big heart. Always. You knew it. You could feel it. Little wonder that the children, the many children and youth she welcomed into her family felt so at home. Just as every child in every one of her classrooms felt at home because she was a beloved teacher to them through the years. And something else I admired about Sandra. Her Christ-likeness. 
she really was very much like Christ in so many ways. But particularly, I thought, it manifested itself in her spirit of forgiveness. She would forgive quickly and easily. You know, I have always believed that one of the central teachings of Jesus could be boiled down to what Dr. Malcolm Talbert, who used to be at First Baptist Church many years ago, was my professor at seminary, and I heard him say it a hundred times. He'd stand there, he always talked with his finger in his coat pocket. And I can still see him now standing there and saying, we will all err in life, either on the side of law or the side of grace. Since we're all going to err anyway, always go with grace. I love that. I think it contains the heart of the gospel actually. Well, Sandra always went with grace. Her name was Sandra, but it could have been Grace because that illustrates who she was. Joy Sims, I saw Joy somewhere over here earlier today, but Joy was at their wedding in 1966, grew up in New Holland Church where Sandra had grown up. She knew Sandra and all her family, and she said she never changed. She never went beyond her roots. And she said, and I quote, she was always the perfect Southern lady. And she was. But I want you to listen to what her own children have to say about her. Because they knew her better than any of us. Except for Nathan. Jason said, Mama lived the golden rule, love your neighbor as yourself. And she was always focused on others. That didn't mean that she didn't want to be in the middle of everything. <laughs> she did want to be in the middle. She wanted to be in the middle where she could see and speak to everyone. She truly cared about others. Even in her last days, she lit up when anyone came to visit. And by the way, so true, two days before she died, I walked in there not even expecting her eyes to be open. But she looked at me and smiled and said, I'm so glad you've come. Jason said her last words to me were intended to provide comfort for me when she said, I don't want you to worry about me, and I love you. Jason says, I'm not worried about her anymore. I know where she is today, and I'm sure going to miss her. Mary Emily says, Mama wasn't just a mama to the four of us. She's been the mama to all of Georgia and beyond. We had so many other brothers and sisters because her heart is so big and welcoming that anyone in need of a little mama love received it. Of course, we didn't always like sharing her, but the impact she has made has changed so many lives. She could shine a light on each person and show them their value and motivate them to get busy making a difference. I hope that each of us received a little bit of mama and we will carry that light and shine it on those in need. The world just needs a few more mamas like her. A whole lot more. Carrie. There are so many things to tell you about my mother. She had green eyes that sparkled like dew on summer leaves. She had hugs that were so comforting and consuming that even in the foulest mood, it made you melt and soften. And she was so funny, although she never meant to be. <laughs> when she spoke, she held you in the palm of her hand or on the edge of your seat waiting for the pearls of wisdom that inevitably turned out to be something so practical and so obvious, like, be nice, get a job, <laughs> or just get along. My mother was a terrible giver of gifts, especially material gifts. Many birthdays and Christmases, we would receive 
a toolbox <laughs> or a trash can <laughs> or some other very practical item unwrapped and still in the bag from the store. <laughs> Way to go, Santa Claus. Her gifts were never in the possession of things. It was in her time, her efforts, her presence, her attendance, and her intentions. There is one phrase that she would use as her reason for everything she did or every piece of advice she gave. And it was this phrase, because it is important. This phrase left the receiver with no chance for rebuttal, no additional explanation, and no way around doing whatever it was that was so important. She never referred to herself as important, only her actions. For example, it was important to stand up straight. I just realized I was slouching. <laughs> to look someone in the eyes. To speak to them as if they were the one who was important. It was important to use your talents to better yourself and others. It was important to do your best with the purest intentions. It was important to do what you're doing today. Show up for others. It was important to spend time with them and welcome them with open arms. It was important to leave every person and situation better than it was before you arrived. I don't think I'll ever hear the word important the same way again without thinking of her and evaluating whether it measures up to her definition of that word. She was the most important person I have ever known, and I am blessed that she was my mother. And Katie, make your trips count. That's what Mama always said, make your trips count. She said it to you too, huh? That's what Mama always said. She was not a fan of useless activities like TV. Ask my dad about his shoot 'em up movies. <laughs> TV was for the news and the news alone. But one of my favorite traditions with Mama was a relatively useless activity. Each Thanksgiving, we would break out a 1,000 piece puzzle and we'd begin working on it and we wouldn't finish until Christmas Day. The two of us and my sisters were devoted to this senseless activity, except it wasn't senseless. We talked, we laughed, we stopped to enjoy each other's company. My mother used the company of others immensely. She enjoyed the company of others immensely, but relaxing was not her strong suit. And it sure wasn't. I've always cherished those memories. Us bent over the card table till our necks were sore and our eyes had become glassy. Trying to quit, but repeating just one more piece until our bladders or our brains made us stop. I remember the quiet rejoicing we would do when one of us had found the last piece. This joyous moment, though, was followed by immediate sadness because we had completed the project that had so brought us together. The feeling is eerily similar now. We're all so lucky to have had her in our lives. Her spirit filled a room as it is doing now. The sadness of her life's completion is deafening. Yet I'm grateful and forever better for knowing her immense love. She did a lot of great work during her 80 trips around the sun, certainly making her trips count. Tributes from the family, and beautiful ones they are. Well, Katie, I ended with you, so now it's your turn. With a servant's heart, we want you to hear this song. And by the way, uh, let me say a word about it. 
This is a special tribute in honor of her mother. It was written by Gainesville's own, the late Bruce Birch, Chris Wright, and Katie Deal for the 2011 and a deal inauguration. The title comes from, Sandra, from Sandra's initiative with a servant's heart, which began as a statewide day of service. The song is written from the perspective of Nathan, reflecting on his childhood, but the second verse in particular fits Sandra to a T.
Thank you, Katie. Well, we enter now a time of remembrance, and we're going to be talking about uh, Sandra from various perspectives. You'll hear from different people now, but I want to tell you one, well, two brief memories about Sandra in my own life. I remember one Sunday when they were going out the door, she and Nathan, at the end of the service. And of course the security detail is with them and all that. And you know, as it, it, those of you who've been in the pulpit, then you know that you don't always do your best. And when you don't, you just feel terrible about it. I'd had one of those Sundays. I thought I'd stammered my way, forgotten things, all of that. So when, when they came through the door, Sandra grabbed my hand warmly. I said, Sandra, I said, do you even have any idea what I was trying to say today? And she said, Preacher, you didn't do as bad as you thought you did. <laughs> she had a way of just making you feel better. I don't care what it was. The other thing I remember about her so well is the first time I went to see their home in, in, uh, on the Chattahoochee there in Habersham County. I love that place. It's so beautiful. And uh, Sandra was the docent that day. And you know, I, I mean, I really thought when I got there, I'd get to go in the living room and maybe see the kitchen. No, I went in every closet in that house. <laughs> the basement, everywhere, everything. We saw it all. I was going up there, I didn't want to take their time. So, you know, I was going to spend maybe 20 minutes. Well, we were there for about two and a half hours. <laughs> Becky Brandon had ridden with me. I was nervous when I got there because she'd talked me to death the whole way. <laughs> so when we got there, we stayed all that long amount of time. And you know what they said? Sandra said, y'all eat with us. I said, well, we've already taken half your day. She said, no, we want you to eat with us. She said, but you're in luck. I'm not cooking. <laughs> and so we went to a restaurant out in the country somewhere there in Cleveland. And of course, the time we walked in, that was the last we saw of either of them because everybody came over to say hello to them and talk with them. But it was a wonderful memory I'll always have. And I love your closets, all of them. They're beautiful. <laughs> So now we ha we're going to hear from a very long-time friend of Sandra's, Sandra Thompson James. Sandra, you begin to make your way up. In high school at East Hall, Sandra Thompson and Sandra Dunnigan were best of friends. Throughout her life, our Sandra Deal was very close to her, all of her high school classmates, some of whom are here today. So Sandra Thompson James is going to tell you about the early days of Sandra Deal's life and their enduring friendship. Thank you, Sandra. I promise not to tell it all, though. <laughs> um, I want to say good afternoon to everybody that's here today, especially family. I haven't gotten to see much of you lately. Um, and I know that there are several of, my, uh, of our classmates back there. So I'm, I'm glad to see all of you. But everybody has a special memory of Sandra, of one way or one kind or another. But I can tell you I have many, many, many more memories than you do. Just for the reason that we've been friends for almost 70 years. Almost 70 years. Um, our friendship began when we met in ninth grade over at Airline High School on White Sulphur Road, that far back. And as luck would have it, we had two classes where she sat in front of me and I sat behind her because we <clears throat> were not alphabetized in that that time period. So she sat in front of me, I sat behind her, and we talked. <laughs> and we talked some more. And we talked for the next four years. 
we saw a lot and we did a lot in those um, four years. And back then, school was so simple. Compared to what it is now, school was so simple. Excuse me. All we had to do was study a little bit and have a little bit of fun and, you know, everything was okay. But uh, we went to airline in ninth grade and in tenth grade we went to airline the first half of the year. They finally opened East Hall and we got to go to East Hall the second half of the year. And so we got to do some new things, you know, not really. I mean, it's all the stuff that girls would do when you're in the ninth and the tenth grade and you're not old enough to, to drive. But we got serious probably in the tenth and eleventh grade and we started taking Latin. And we studied together on Latin. And I was so proud that we could take Latin at East Hall back then. And the other thing that kind of worked us over was chemistry. We spent a lot of time on that. But we just did all the regular things. You know, we, we belonged to clubs. Uh, we had sleepovers, you know, all the regular things. But uh, one of the things that we did, and this was in 11th grade, and Janice Miller was the author of, of what happened here. But our psychology teacher had arranged it for us, Sandra and me and Janice Miller and Judy Perkle, to go to one of the churches in Gainesville and talk about being a teenager. And I don't know what we had been fed, you know, in psychology class that, that, <clears throat> that we were supposed to say, but we went. But that's not what I remember about all of that. We got rear-ended at the New Holland Tunnel. <laughs> That's what I remember about that. But anyway, um, one of the things that we did during school, when we were in ninth grade especially, there were four girls from Sandra's school and four girls from my school, that Bonnie Brownlow put us all together and we started singing together. And so, we did a lot of singing all the way, uh, all the way through high school. Um, I was trying to think of all of the places that we sang and it's just unbelievable that we were on TV one time. We, we sang at a talent show somewhere in Atlanta and it was broadcast live on a radio station. I mean, when you, when you think of it, it's crazy. It's just crazy. Um, after, after about the 10th grade, I think is when we formed our trio. And I don't know if Carol would or if um, any of the other girls that sang with us are here, but we had a lot of invitations to sing. We sang everywhere that anybody would ask us to come and sing. But we, we were on the TV show. We sang at camp meeting one year. Uh, we sang um, at the literary meet. We represented East Hall in the literary meet one year. And of course we didn't win, but we went and we tried. And the other thing about all the places that we went around singing Sandra's mother and sister accompanied us most of the time. And um, Sandra's mother was also our chauffeur most of the time. Um, if I could go back a little bit, as I said, in ninth grade there were eight of us that started out together. I don't know who took us to the studios of WDUN and WGGA, but we sang in the, their studios. And I, I said, to what end? I don't know. I don't know why we did that, but we did it. Um, the other, uh, the most memorable thing, and it's kind of funny and it's kind of sad too about our singing, and I'll stop with that about our singing, but, and this was when we were in ninth grade, 
there was a funeral over at the old Airline Baptist Church, which is straight across the road from the school. And so we didn't know the person that had died, but our principal was a member over there. So he marches us girls across the road, and we sang a song for the funeral, and then he marched us back up, uh, across the road to our classes. And that was, that was one of the funniest things I thought that we ever did. You may have heard about our graduating class. It was small, and we've always been close. Um, we're still close. And in fact, uh, we have had two or three meetings a year. We have had four in the past, but our last meeting was May 21st, and Sandra was there. And so was Nathan, so was Mary, Emily, and Katie. So that soon ago, you know, she was, was still with us. Um, the thing that Sandra did about our class, two things she was really, well, she was really good with the phones. Any of our classmates that would say no to me or somebody else, they don't, wouldn't say no to Sandra. <laughs> if she asked them to do something or come or, or something like that, they did. Um, but it was like you mentioned her face just lighting up the room and it always happened. It always happened, it never failed, that when she joined our group, it changed the whole demeanor of our, of our group, always. Um, and the other thing that she did that she didn't have to do was invite us all to the mansion one time for our 55th reunion. Sandra and I, even though I've lived out of state, some of these years, we kept in touch. No matter what was going on with her, we always knew where the other one was. We always got together every time that we could get together. And, and like someone else said, she, she was a wise child, a wise teenager, um, and a wise woman. She was not there wasn't a flatty bone in her body that I ever saw. But this is to Sandra. I would like to thank you, Sandra, for all your support, all your encouragement in the trying times that we went through back then. Uh, I cherish every moment that I ever spent with her. That's it. You know, we have others here today that I would like to mention, but I'm going to wait because Chris Riley is going to mention them when he comes up in a little bit. But others that we want you to be aware of their presence here today who are involved with our state government. Our next speaker is Frank Berry. Frank, if you'll make your way on up. He has served in several positions of state government during the Deal administration including that of Commissioner of the Department of Community Health. He worked with Sandra on the children's cabinet she created. Frank had a front row seat to observe Sandra's passion for children and her commitment to improving their opportunities and giving them hope. Thank you, Frank. Well, good afternoon, everyone. So it's kind of funny because about a week and a half ago, we were all supposed to be together for a birthday celebration and an, and an anniversary celebration. And she couldn't make it, but somehow she figured out a creative way <laughs> to get everybody together. And that is Sandra Deal. She would have loved nothing more than to be standing in this room, going up and down these aisles, talking with all of us, and hearing about families, and hearing about children, and hearing about careers, and hearing about everything that you were doing. And when you'd see her next time, she'd ask you details about those things. That was First Lady Deal. Like somebody said earlier, um, 
I've had the privilege of working for two governors. Governor Deal appointed me in 2012. Governor Kemp allowed me to stay, and I'm grateful to both of you. And I have to say, I've had the opportunity to introduce you both at conferences. That doesn't compare to this. <laughs> that does not compare to this. There's a couple of major points that I wanted to touch on. Passion. Everybody talks about First Lady Deal going around the state and reading to children. And it was a remarkable experience. And if you got to go with her, it was over the top incredible. But it wasn't just that she read to children. It was that she interacted with children and got them to feel like they were the most important thing in the world. Any of us can go and read a book. First Lady Deal could read a book and she would sit down with them on the floor or on a chair and they would huddle around and their eyes would light up and they will carry that with them for the rest of their lives that the First Lady of Georgia spent time with me reading. What a remarkable, remarkable thing she did. Humor. Oh boy. So at the First Lady's Children's Cabinet, there was a group of us, and many of them are here today, and it was such an incredible honor to work with them. But we had this First Lady's Children's Cabinet, and we would talk, and there was an executive committee, and there was a large committee, and she would say to us, and for those of you that were in the room, you'll remember some of these things, she would say, now listen, I know Nathan doesn't get to spend as much time with you all as he would like to. So if there are certain things you would like for me to convey to him, I will do that. But then she took it to the next level. She'd say, I do sleep in the same bed with him. And she'd pause. And then she would say, and we don't always sleep. And we all would go, oh my gosh, okay. And um, so she had humor. She had a sense of humor. She was a family person. And during those First Ladies Children's Cabinets, so when I started back in 2012, uh, uh, there was a, a person that hired me, Bart Gobeal. Bart, are you in here anywhere? There's Bart. Bart hired me. And, and Bart's about 6'4", and I'm only about six feet tall. And, <laughs> And, and Bart looked down at me just by a couple of inches. And, and Bart said, now, Frank, there's one thing I need to tell you. There's this thing called the First Lady's Children's Cabinet. Do not be late for that meeting. Okay, yes, sir, I understood, I got it. And I didn't know, I, I had never met First Lady Deal. And I had never met Governor Deal until we, we started working together. I said, okay. And then you have a meeting with Chris Riley. And, and Chris Riley says, now, Frank, I, I want to reiterate something to you that we talked about during your interview. Uh, we kind of operate as a family here. And so we're respectful to each other. We treat each other with dignity and respect. And, and we're a family. And as long as you're a part of that family, we've got your back. And I'll, I'll never forget that, Chris, when you talked about that. So family, though, not just the immediate deal family, which we all are jealous of because it's an incredible family. And we learned more about all of you because she would tell us about you. She would share stories about you. She would share the photo albums of the summertime trips when you guys went to all the Georgia State Parks. And she would share it, and we'd go through page by page, and she'd say, and then this happened. And then Nathan couldn't be here right this minute, but he came an hour later, and that's why he's not in this picture, but he'll be in this picture. <laughs> but he made it to every trip, and how important that was to tell us about grandchildren and tell us how important they were to her life. And we felt a part of that. Compassion and empathy. So one of the challenges that we had in Georgia when Governor Deal started, thanks to Governor Perdue, was a settlement agreement with the United States Department of Justice. And we were implementing that settlement agreement that was signed. And it was a challenge. And, and First Lady Deal said, now tell me what that's about. 
and we told her what it was about and it was moving individuals and it was the right thing to do it was moving individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities out into their own homes and out into their own communities and we were transitioning people from state institutions into their own homes and and first lady deal said well i'd like to visit some of these people how can we get that done and we worked with the team and there was a a, a woman miss brown who we had transitioned from milledgeville and i've heard stories about milledgeville i'm sure many of you in here have too we transitioned a, a young lady from Milledgeville to Atlanta Regional Hospital. Young lady, she was 92 years old and she had been with us since 1954. And we did a hospital site visit and I can't remember who was with me. It was Ember. We, we, we did a site visit to that hospital and we walked around and you mentioned earlier, she talked to every person that was responsible for cleaning the facility she talked to every person that was responsible for keeping the cafeteria nice and then we walked by miss brown's room and she said let's go let's go in there and we went in there and she sat with miss brown now miss brown couldn't hear she couldn't talk she couldn't see she'd been with us since 1954 and First Lady Deal sat down, the two of us, with her, and Ember was there with us. And she held her hand for two hours. And she talked to her about everything that was going on in the state of Georgia. Everything that was going on. Ember came over and said, First Lady Deal, it's time we get going. You tell that next group that we're going to be a little bit late. <laughs> yes, ma'am. And we stayed and we did that. So compassion and empathy independence she wanted to leave her own mark and and i know she was proud of what you did but boy she wanted to leave her own mark too <laughs> talk about and and i'm going to steal a little bit of your thunder water safety safe sleep immunizations reading campaign and the hot car seat issues she wanted those to be her marks things that she championed and then she every once in a while would say well maybe the governor can help me get some of this rolling <laughs> so she was independent supportive oh my gosh you think about all of the work the hard work that the state employees do and the incredible teams that I've gotten to work with and the incredible teams that work for our state departments and sometimes morale would go down a little bit and it wasn't always easy and she made it a point to go and visit crisis stabilization units. These are facilities that have some of Georgia's most violent and aggressive children, all the way up to the age of 18 years old. And she'd go in there like she owned the place. And she'd walk into these group settings with these people and they would look at us like, oh my gosh, who are you all? And she, by the end of that period of time, had every one of those kids doing something unique reading because she would talk to them about the importance of educating yourself and reading and again these were some of the people that nobody wanted to be around equally as important to that was that those state employee team members saw that a first lady cared deeply about them and spent time with them and listened to them and learned what they were doing and cared about them and was grateful for what they were doing to help our young people in this state she went to an after-school program called the clubhouse which was designed for children that had significant addictive disease issues she told them more about addiction because she became an expert in it because her son was a treatment court judge and you all must have talked about it and she was constantly learning and encouraging those children that they could do better and she would be there for them if they needed her encouraging the first lady wanted to learn about what each one of us was doing she would ask detailed questions not just superficial things and she would always have a follow-up question about our work and she showed us that we were an instrumental piece of the team 
that was changing the way state government was working under her husband. Friendship. I remember not too long ago, and Alyssa is here, maybe it was a year and a half ago, it was during COVID, I got a phone call. Every once in a while, I'd get a neat text. I got a text of the slumber party motley crew. And I have it on my phone. I looked at it this morning where several of you are in a picture wearing the sleepover crew or a sleepover squad. But friendship, you talk about friendship. She asked if I would help First, First Lady Sanders with something. And I called First Lady Sanders and we talked and we scheduled some follow-up time. And that conversation lasted about an hour. And all First Lady Sanders talked about was how before COVID, First Lady Deal would come and see me on a regular basis, almost every week. She'd come and visit with me. And now that COVID hit, we don't get to do that, but she calls me usually two to three times a week to check in on me just to see how I'm doing. And then I heard all about South Georgia and I heard about North Georgia and I heard about all those stories. So friendship, opportunities. Many of you know that at the mansion with Governor Deal and First Lady Deal, they had a lot of people that were working there that had been involved in the juvenile, in the correctional system or the, the pardons and parole system. And they were transitioning to their next stop First Lady Deal would help them get jobs when they would transition back into the community. There was one young man who wasn't necessarily so young, he's probably my, about my age, 56, 57 years old, who was getting ready to move home, and he didn't have a car. And she, First Lady Deal coordinated with Butch Miller, along with several other, other of us, and we bought that man a car under her leadership we helped him get a car so that he could be successful when he transitioned home. That was under her leadership, not yours. That was under her leadership. You might not have even known about that. <laughs> she was fun. Those late nights, I can only imagine what that would have been like to have that slumber party squad. She was fun. She had the governor uh, would take children Never forget this. I went to a first lady's children's cabinet and she was a few minutes late. Now she threw you under the bus because she said it was your fault that you slept in because you guys had been out the night before partying. You took six or seven children with autism and intellectual and developmental disability to a Braves game. Press doesn't know about that. They don't know about those things. Just the two of you took a group of kids to a Braves game and had fun. And she blamed it on you that she was a few minutes late because she needed to make sure she got your breakfast ready. <laughs> she was an influencer and an advocate. We'd talk about children's work and there were many of us who were deeply passionate about children's services. And before you know it, you'd get a phone call from Teresa McCartney. Hey, we're gonna add some money into the budget. We're gonna address autism in the state of Georgia. We're gonna put money in for before and after school programs. She was an advocate. She put her money where her mouth was. She spoke to him at night. That bed was not just there for sleeping. She talked to him. She was an incredible wife. We had a South Georgia trip one time and I didn't get to travel that much with Governor Deal, but on those few times we did, we made the best of it. And we had a South Georgia trip one time and we flew, it was my first time on the state plane, we flew down to South Georgia, we had three or four stops. One of those stops, we realized that we had a black tie event that night and we realized that, well, I didn't realize, Governor realized he forgot his black socks. So we had to go to the local Belk. I think it was either in, Augusta, uh, not Augusta, in Valdosta maybe. And, and he didn't have black socks. So we were in the, uh, state patrol was, was driving us and we pulled into the, the Belks and we stopped in the front and he went in with one of the security detail and they got socks and we came back and then we, we did another event and then we had to change into the black tie. And so we put our, in the back of a library, by the way, and, and your collar was up and so we all had to fix each other's collars and 
Then we went to this black, oh, and then we came out of Belks and the governor looks across the parking lot. And this does play a role in this story. Governor looks across the parking lot and says, hey, and Andre was there. Do y'all like ice cream? There's a Brewster's over there. <laughs> Who's gonna say no to Brewster's when it's middle of summer? So we went to Brewster's and we had ice cream. And there's this woman ordering this gigantic banana split huge banana split and there's four of us there's four men and a couple of of, of of women with us and and governor stands behind her and he says I sure would like to be the one splitting that banana split with you and she doesn't turn around and she says I'm not splitting this banana split with anybody I skip my breakfast and I skip my lunch so that I can have this and he says ma'am I'm, I'm sorry and she turns around and, and she says, oh gosh, a bunch of, bunch of suits. You all must not be from here. You're from Atlanta, aren't you? And he, and he says, yes, ma'am, I'm Nathan Deal, and I'm running for re-election, and I would appreciate your vote. And, and, and so that night, we didn't get home. We left at about 5.30 or 6 o'clock in the morning. And we didn't get home until almost midnight, maybe 1 o'clock. The next, that was a Wednesday. The next morning was a First Lady's Children's Cabinet. Now, I'm, I'm tired, but we go in there. And after the First Lady's Children's Cabinet, First Lady says, Do you, can you stay for a few extra minutes? I said, yes, ma'am. And she says, Nathan told me all about that trip and about the socks. And he was so mad. They told him it was black tie, and you guys were the only ones in black tie. We, we think they did that on purpose, but it's okay similar to what you said earlier but it's okay and then she went on to say this now listen I've been working really hard with Nathan about keeping that weight off you all have got to do a better job of taking care of him you cannot let him have ice cream all the time and so an incredible wife who was always keeping out for your best interest and then, you know, in case any of you didn't know, when you're the governor and the first lady, you get driving, you get, uh, state patrol drives you around a lot. Well, when the second term was up and, and governor was teaching, he didn't like to necessarily drive. So first lady would drive across the mountains to get him to his classrooms. Well, I happened to have the honor of, of helping with one of those classes one time and Similar to what's, what you said earlier, well, why don't you come to the house and see the house afterwards? And we did, and let, but let's go get dinner. Well, I followed her across the mountains. I think my knuckles are still white <laughs> because she could drive. She, and when we'd stop, she'd say, now nah, I'm just used to these. Am I driving too fast? <laughs> no, no I, I'll try to keep up. So she was passionate she had a great sense of humor she was devoted to family she demonstrated compassion and empathy she was independent supportive she was a great friend she provided opportunities for people that did not have a fair share of opportunities she was fun she was an influencer before that term even became popular she was an influencer she was an incredible wife. And that's what we're here to celebrate. Governor, several years ago in one of your State of the State addresses, you talked about seeds and roots and trees. And you and the First Lady, the impact that you've had on generations to come will be felt throughout our great state for years. You should be proud of her we are proud of you, we are proud of her, and it is an honor of a lifetime to have worked with the two of you. Thank you. You know, uh, we're, we're saying a lot, a lot of things today about Sandra's sense of humor, but you know, Nathan has a good sense of humor too. In fact, my favorite Nathan Deal story. They're on the way down to South Georgia. They stop in 
is it Pooler? Is that the name of it? Uh, is that the name of that town? Anyway, they go in a little convenience store. He wanted to get a Coke or something. So the detail pulls in. Nathan gets out and goes in. And the girl behind the little counter in there, she said, this is after he was been governor for a few months. She said, I know who you are. And Governor Deal said, you do? She said, yes. You're Sonny Purdue. <laughs> And you know, he just walked out and let that go. I, that was the big surprise. I've decided, I love what you said, Frank, about, about the governor and the first lady getting to ride around with state troopers driving them everywhere. So I want to be the spouse of a governor. Jeannie, will you run for governor? Not this term, not this term, but another time. So we can just be taken everywhere. Now we're going to have one of our state troopers, Jim Andrews, is going to come now. And uh, so Jim Andrews and David Herring were the first Georgia State Patrol troopers assigned to accompany Nathan and Sandra back when they first got the nomination for governor. Throughout two campaigns for governor and two terms in office, Jim was a part of their executive security team. After the deals left office, and Jim had retired from the state patrol, he has remained very close to the Deal family. Today, he's chief of security at Piedmont University, where Sandra also served on the board of trustees. And we welcome you to talk to us for a moment about Sandra. Thank You're you. getting into my stories. <laughs> <laughs> As Dr. Coach said, David Heron and I were the first two troopers assigned to, to Governor Deal and Sandra. I'll never forget our first meeting with then Mr. Deal and Chris Riley. We were told that we was not just joining a team, that we was joining a part of a family. Little did I realize at that moment how special this family would become to us. And when I was invited to speak here today, come full circle, Governor. Come full circle. Okay. After that warm, fuzzy staff meeting, we was called into Chris Riley's office and we was given a talk by him. <laughs> I'll never forget the words that Chris Riley told us. Never let Sandra Deal make it to the back of a room on a campaign stop. <laughs> you see, we were in the fight of our lives to win an election. We would travel across the state and we'd probably have eight, ten or more stops every day. Keeping a schedule was imperative. The schedule did not mean a single thing to Sandra. <laughs> but Sandra knew that those Georgians at those stops were our voters, and they each one deserved a hello and a short conversation. <laughs> I remember one stop in particular, I think we was in Buckhead. Uh, Sandra, of course, was in the back of the room as usual. But I was so proud of myself. I went back there and I got her, I got her right up to the door we was fixing to step, step out. Somebody walked up to me and spoke to me and I turned around and she was back in the back of the meeting again, <laughs> helping, helping clean up. So by the time I got her in the vehicle, we was already supposed to be at our next stop and I knew what was coming next. My phone was gonna feel like a yellow jacket's nest going off because Denise, Denise did was gonna want to know where we was at. As I look back now, I often wonder those few extra minutes that Sandra spent being herself isn't the reason we won that election, Governor. Shortly after the election, shortly after that win of that election, I was in the gym one day and a friend of mine walked in. You see, whenever I was on duty, I didn't have to stay at the Governor's River House because I lived like 10 minutes from him. Anyway, one of my friends come in and he said, I have just saw Governor-elect Deal and Miss Deal in GNC by themselves. <laughs> in other words, they had escaped executive security. <laughs> my wife was with me and she could tell that I was troubled. 
When she asked what was the matter, I explained that Nathan and Sandra had escaped and they were doing their best impression of Thelma and Louise. <laughs> they was taking one last trip to town by themselves. <laughs> Sandra Deal was a retired school teacher that never actually retired. When you traveled with Miss Sandra, especially internationally, you were expected to use it as a learning experience. You know that's right, Amber. I remember one stop in Israel, we came to the Stone of the Anointing, the stone where Jesus' body was prepared. Miss Deal could tell that there was something about that stone that astonished me. Out of the blue, she said, Jim, you need to touch that stone. Where'd that come from? I don't know. I thought, here I am trying to look all professional, and Miss Deal is wanting me to reach over and touch that stone. But as you know, there's no telling, Miss Sandra, no. <laughs> so I kneeled down and I touched that stone, and as soon as I touched it with my fingertips, I felt cold chills start in my fingertips and run up my arm and go down to my toes. To this day, I still use that experience as, as a part of my personal testimony. Thank you, Sandra. My most prized possession for, from Sandra Deal is a copy of Memories of the Mansion because she, I know how much she loved the Georgia Governor's Mansion, but not for the reasons that you think she would love it. She believed that the mansion was a historical site that belonged to all Georgians. She opened it up for all to see. She wanted them to learn about it and she wanted them to enjoy it. If you're part of the deal team, she wanted you there and she wanted you to enjoy it. She wanted your family to enjoy it. Let's talk about grandma's camp for a second. <laughs> I'm sure we all remember grandma's camp. It was Miss Deal, Ember, the grandchildren, Trooper Bobby Mathis, and to make this funny story, I, make this story funny, I have to kind of tell you a little bit about Bobby. Bobby was probably a six foot five, six foot six trooper, weighed closer to 400 pounds than he ever did, 300 pounds. <laughs> we were given the opportunity to go behind the scenes to see and pet the pandas. But before we did, we all had to put on a green robe, green shoe covers, green things that cover our hair. Bobby and I looked like two stooges about to do surgery or something. <laughs> Once again, Sandra insisted that Bobby and I take turns petting those pandas. <laughs> but you know what? It turned out to be one of my funniest stories that I enjoy telling the most about my experiences with Sandra. I guess because whenever I got home and I told my kids about that, they loved it so much. Not going to look at you, Governor. If you're like me, you've asked the Governor and you've asked the family, what can I do? Let me tell you what Sandra would want you to do. She would want you to take a little something that you've learned from her and pay it forward. My takeaway from Sandra was her kindness. After Sandra, got, after Sandra got sick this last time, I went to see her a good bit. As bad as she felt, she always asked about my wife and about my kids, how they were, what was going on in their lives. Governor, Sandra, and the entire Deal family, let me take the opportunity to thank you on behalf of the entire executive security staff for allowing us to share the adventures of your lives. Jason Deal, you once said that whenever the governor won election, you got the brothers that you never had in our executive security team. Governor Deal, while you was in office, we lost two troopers, Bobby Mathis and Tony Henry. And I've already told you this. I guarantee you the second and the third person that Sandra Deal met when she went into heaven after Jesus was those two troopers. <laughs> Deal children, you will forever be our brothers and our sisters. We're all better people because of the love that you showed us. 
I've got one last thing before I step down. I have a confession to make to Sandra. I was always afraid to do this until now. Sandra, I was not always truthful to you. As a matter of fact, there was times that I flat out lied to you. Do you remember the times that you were out of town reading to all those children and you stayed overnight? The very next day when you got home, you would always ask me, Jim, did you get the governor home to the mansion so he could eat his meal that Simon had prepared for him? <laughs> My answer was always undoubtedly yes. But the truth is, when you was out of town overnight on those trips, we never, ever made it home without going by the varsity and picking up a couple of children. <laughs> That was great. Well, Simon was supposed to be here today, the chef, Simon, for the governor's mansion. But I want to tell you this story so you'll know why he's not here today. When Sandra was getting increasingly sick and she would be on lots of medication in the last few weeks, one night, one of many nights when she'd have everybody get up at two o'clock because she said it was time for breakfast when it wasn't. So they would eat breakfast at two o'clock. One night she woke them up. She said, Nathan, we've got to get down to the governor's mansion. And he said, we don't need to go to the governor's mansion. Why do you want to go down there? And she said, we've got to go see the baby. And Nathan said, the baby, what, what are you talking about? She said, we've got to go see Simon's baby. And he said, well, they haven't had the baby yet. The baby's not due for another three or four months. So you just go back to sleep and we'll, we'll check on the baby another time. Well, you know what? That baby was born that night. That baby was born the same hour that Sandra said, we've got to go see the baby. Isn't that amazing? And not only that, that baby today, who has been doing fine, premature baby, but the baby's in the hospital. So Simon had to make a decision whether to be with that baby or whether to come here. And you know what he did? He did what Sandra would have told him to do. He's with the baby. And we wish them all good things today. Now we're going to hear from Chris Wright. This is a song of tribute. I want to tell you about it as Chris makes his way up. This will be performed by somebody we all know well, a former son-in-law to the Dills. Chris and his extended family have had close ties with the Dills and still do. He is honored to be singing today the song, The Last Rose of Summer. This was written by none other than Nathan Deal himself for Sandra many years ago. It was originally performed for the First Family in 2015 by Chris with the Atlanta Pops Orchestra. As we're nearing the end of summer now and celebrating the life of Sandra Deal today, you'll understand why these tender poetic words are truer now more than ever.
For she is ever changing as the seasons of my life. She gives purpose to my being and strength amid the strife. With fruit, so I won't stray. She'll be my mighty oak in autumn, giving grace and strength to me. She'll be the evergreen of my winter when I shall cease to be. For she is ever changing as the seasons of my. My last rose of summer, she's my lady. Ember Bishop, where's Ember? Come up here, Ember. Listen, and she's bringing she's bringing the whole team with her. Uh, Ember was the one in charge of Sandra Deal's office, and she's a lot like Sandra <laughs> in that no, really, in that that beautiful smile, that warmth, that acceptance of everybody. Um, she is absolutely one of the best people ever to have worked in the deal administration and we're honored now to hear from her as she pays tribute to the woman she worked for and uh, I'll let her tell you the rest of the story. Okay, y'all file in. <laughs> Bloom where you were planted. This was Mrs. Deal's advice that she shared in one of her very first interviews as First Lady. My name is Ember Bishop Bentley, and behind me is her team, some of her team. Ms. Deal spread these words of wisdom throughout the state during her time as First Lady. Ms. Deal also planted seeds of opportunity, seeds of courage, seeds of love, seeds of joy and trust and friendship. But Ms. Deal, as her team affectionately and fondly called her, gave us so much more. I look around this room today and celebrate the seeds that were planted and that are thriving because of her. Miss Deals shared in our highs and in our lows, our happiness and our sorrows. She shared our deepest secrets. She supported our biggest of dreams. She provided a perfect pathway for us to bloom. An educator to her core, Miss Deal was our teacher, and we learned from her, and we got to learn about this beautiful state. As a teacher, Mrs. Deal didn't teach to just one student. She taught every single student in her class. This was also her approach to being the First Lady. Miss Deal was genuinely interested in the lives of Georgia's children and in their development. She read to more than 250,000 children in over 1,000 schools and visited all of our beautiful 159 counties. In addition, Miss Deal expanded the work of the First Lady's Cabinet, and she would call it the Georgia Children's Cabinet. The cabinet provided unique leadership on child welfare issues in Georgia by identifying strategic priorities. And then she developed an initiative in response. 
You can see these planted seeds all around the state continuing today because of her leadership. For example, Read Across Georgia and Georgia Pre-K Week. The Safe Sleep, Splash Water Safety, and Look Again Hot Car Awareness Campaigns. The Sandra Deal Learning Center at Camp Jekyll, and the Sandra Dunnigan Deal Center at Georgia College, just to name a few. Ms. Deal was truly talented. She was a connector. You all know she loved people. She listened. She learned. Ms. Deal was also a gifted weaver of the written word and was well known for her beautiful thank you notes. Much like her name tag, we never went anywhere without a set of stationery, just in case. A major milestone for Ms. Deal was the publication of the book, Memories of the Mansion. She was keenly aware of the importance of documenting the governor's mansion history while also sharing the stories of the families who live there and the treasures that are housed there. She believes strongly in preserving the people's house. And she allowed us to do all of this with her together as her team. She shared this opportunity as first lady with each of us. What an incredible, life-changing gift. She also shared with us her love for Dairy Queen pit stops. <laughs> Sensible heels, Miranda and Jasmine. <laughs> the importance of wearing your name tag and making sure you choose the right pocketbook that wouldn't hurt your back. <laughs> We loved singing hymns as we rode the back roads of Georgia, eating rice cakes for snacks, because you know, lips to hips, ladies. <laughs> we love spending the night in our state parks. And we love listening to her advice about finding the right spouse. She loved grandma's camp, her marathon mansion tours, and talking and taking photos with every single person in a room. We loved her wisdom, her goodness, her humbleness. We loved her. As a Christian, Miss Deal believed in the power of prayer, much like my grandmother did. I am convinced that prayer and divine intervention planted Miss Deal in my life. Every third Wednesday of every month, a devoted group of wonderful ladies would serve as docents alongside Miss Deal. And then they spent the afternoon in prayer. <laughs> Miss Deal and her prayer group gave me this daily devotional book when I transitioned to a new role within the administration. They knew I would need Jesus for that. <laughs> the devotional on August 23rd said this, entrust your loved one to me. Release them into my protective care. My presence will go with them wherever they go and I will give them rest. This same presence stays with you as you place your trust in me. Watch, see what I will do. And Miss Deal was a doer. She was productive and practical as she challenged and she championed those around her. Miss Deal was also known for her opinions <laughs> and she was not shy about sharing them with you. As her team, we also, well, and not just as her team, but the entire press team, we also never really knew what she was going to say. <laughs> she never wrote a speech, and she really did not care for talking points from the staff. <laughs> she was more interested in speaking from the heart, and honestly, it was better than any prepared speech. We also learned the power of the phrase, Nobody told me. <laughs> That's a good one. 
Um, <laughs> for you gentlemen in the room, she never shied away from making sure that you buttoned your suit jacket for a photo. Miss Steele was deeply committed. She was thoughtful. She was kind and funny. She was focused. She was very determined. She encouraged us as her team to be the exact same way. As we leave here today, let us be more like Miss Deal. Let's stay a little bit longer. Let's write more thank you notes. Let's listen. Let's never stop learning. Let's make people feel special. Let's make people feel loved. Let's make people feel important. And above all, Miss Deal would look at every single one of you, especially in an election year, and she would tell you to be nice <laughs> to the family. Thank you for sharing your mother and grandmother with me, with all of us. We are better people because of her. Governor Deal, we are here for you, and we are so incredibly grateful to have been a part of Miss Deal's story, of her legacy of her light. Thank you. We love you. And I promise we will continue to plant seeds. I challenge each of us to give of your time and of your talents and do so with a servant's heart. Be a channel of blessings and bloom where you are planted. Thank you. Chris Riley is going to come up here now, and I don't really have to introduce him. He was the chief of staff for the governor for a long time. He was so much a part of the governor's life and of Sandra's life. He is a homegrown boy from right here in Gainesville, Georgia. Today he works in consulting, and I don't need to say anything more about Chris Riley because he's dear to all of us. We love and appreciate him, and we're very grateful for what he meant to the Deal team. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, sir. I'm almost certain Sandra right now is laughing because she knows it is eating me alive that we're so far behind schedule. <laughs> And she's relishing the moment. <laughs> to the Deal family, Governor and First Lady Marty Kemp, Governor and Ms. Purdue, Speaker and Mrs. Ralston, members of the Judicial Corps, State Constitutional Officers, members of the General Assembly, and friends, what a day the Lord hath made as we celebrate the life of Sandra Dunnigan Deal, SD as we often refer to her within the governor's office. As we all know SD, I have no doubt the good Lord said to her this morning, it's going to be a beautiful day. I got this. <laughs> I'm not sure how it is in other administrations, but in the deal administration, the chief of staff might have to alter the governor and first lady's schedule approve events, appointments that need to be placed on the schedule or changed or maybe prioritized so that the governor and first lady could attend. These of course were requests that would come in after our weekly staff meeting but nevertheless on the first lady's iPhone these scheduled events would appear, disappear, and change times. This did not create a good situation. <laughs> the term you heard Ember use and phrase commonly said from a frustrated SD when asked by staff if she was attending the event with ND but directed to me, no one told me. <laughs> the thought of gathering here today one week after a canceled birthday party and wedding anniversary celebration for Nathan and Sandra 
to celebrate with former staff and friends, see expanded families, new births, hear career changes from staff is fitting. So with that in mind, as I started to prepare my remarks and draft a few notes down, I smiled, sat back in my chair, shook my head side to side, and said, touche. <laughs> We've heard stories of Sandra from her younger years through her more experienced years. Today, I want to reflect on the last 30 years from my view. On May 25th, 1992, I walked into Deal for Congress office. On August 17th, 2022, I walked out of her bedroom. My heart was in my throat with 30 years of memories and lessons learned. I can sum up the past 30 years in one sentence. Sandra Dill lived a successful life, and she used her success to live a life of significance. However, since this is about Sandra, she would say, Chris, you have to tell people what you mean. You can't be all fluff. <laughs> so let's go a little deeper, as she would say. In the congressional years, Sandra was teaching sixth grade, and she and Nathan were raising two teenage daughters. And they, make, they became caretakers for her parents and Nathan's mother. And at one point, we're living in the house. We're all living in the house with Nathan and Sandra. During the week, he was going to DC. And on most weekends, he had certain obligations in the district he had to attend. This to me is one of the best examples of her leading with her heart. Sandra the campaigner, April 24th, 2009, Nathan has decided to run for governor. She looks up at all of us and says, keep it nice, tell the truth, keep a haircut. <laughs> I think two of the three were directed at Philip and I. <laughs> that was April 2009 and she wanted to hit the ground running. I kept saying, it's a marathon, not a sprint. Finally, 2010 arrived. The primary was in July. She wanted to campaign across Georgia. She was a retail politician. She wanted to talk to you, listen to you, but most of all, she wanted to leave you material about her husband, Nathan, with pictures of her children and her grandchildren. April 2010 through the end of October, I think Sandra had put over 50,000 miles on a used white van Butch had found for us that we had wrapped with a deal real sticker. <laughs> she campaigned harder for deal for governor than anyone I know because she told me. <laughs> Often. <laughs> If there was a festival, a parade, celebration, Sandra Deal was there front and center, handing out literature, in the van waving as the parade proceeded, placing lapel stickers on supporters. In 2010, campaigns and elections were evolving from retail politics into digital and social platforms. But Sandra Deal was one of the best retail politicians there was. She engaged more at festivals with people and at parades and stops on the trail than I ever imagined. While Deal for Governor did transition into new technology and concepts with voter outreach to reach its voters in the primary of 2010, I will continue to believe that her hard work proved to be successful and demonstrated the raw power of retail politics in Georgia. Three weeks ago, I had gone by to pick up Nathan for a Governor Kemp event in Habersham. I went early to visit with Sandra, but she became upset when she realized she wasn't going. She wanted to go see Marty. She wanted to help Governor Kemp get reelected. She loved to campaign, and she wanted to help. 
Remember the three things I told you that she told us before entering the governor's race? Tell the truth, be nice, and keep a haircut. As the campaign wore on, the team and I may have wanted to go in a contrast direction. <laughs> in political terms, this simply means showing the difference between Nathan and other candidates. Well, those three things might as well have been added by Moses to the commandments in numbered 11, 12, and 13. <laughs> but Sandra taught me a valuable lesson here. We did find common ground, but no matter what, be true to yourself, be true to your community, get the job done, be nice, and know when it's over, you will always come back home. She had a successful life, and she used her success to live a life of significance. Sandra Deal, the First Lady of Georgia. December 2010. Sandra said, Chris, I think I need someone to help me as First Lady. And I need a book telling me about the governor's mansion. If I'm going to live there, I want to know about it. Well, the first was super easy to me. Amber would be a great fit and Amelia hit it off. But her second request, I had no clue. I asked Joy Forth at the mansion and Joy said, well, there's a book of inventory. So I went to Steve Stansel at Georgia Building Authority and he said, Chris, we can have a book of inventory. But Sandra wanted a book about the history of the bench. We could not find a book anywhere. Three years later, she ended up teaming up with Kennesaw State University and writing her own book and had it published. As January 11th, January 2011 passes, she asked me one day, are you thinking about issues I can focus on that work with Nathan's agenda? I didn't have a complete answer. Big mistake. <laughs> it's now late March. Session is starting to narrow down. Pressure is high, and I would often stay during the weeks of the session because of the long hours and short nights. I usually walked up the stairs to the kitchen where she had asked Simon to leave something left over from their dinner. 99.9% .9 of the time, they would be in the living room when I, would, when I would have arrived after grabbing a bite to eat and would go in and sit down and discuss work, politics, legislation, anything that was going on in the office. And I found it as a way that would keep her in the loop. However, this night, she is waiting at the kitchen table. <laughs> it's just her. I come in, I walk straight across the kitchen floor, right to the refrigerator where the water's kept. I did this to assess the room and to buy more time to think about what is about to happen. <laughs> I turn and face her, and it's the look. Everyone who's ever been in trouble knows the look. I don't care who it comes from, but when it comes from a school teacher, it is laser-like. And I said in my best North Georgia, yes, ma'am. <laughs> she said, I need an issue to work on that you think is appropriate for the governor of Georgia. There was no pretext of, Chris, have you given any more thought? Or even the word Nathan. I said, yes, ma'am. And she concluded with, I'm not going to sit at this mansion and twiddle my thumbs all day. She got up and walked out. On the kitchen table the next morning, before she had come downstairs, I'd placed a note at her seat well before she got up. It simply read, Anything you want to do is fine by me. <laughs> but if you do something around education as a former teacher, you would be great. The governor gets in the office a little later and I walk in to brief him on what's happened between 7 a.m. and 8.30 and say, how was your morning? He said, better than my night. Sandra initially wanted to focus on issues related to sixth grade age children. She said at this age, they still like their parents and their teachers. However, in the governor's first inaugural address, he had mentioned that seven out of 10 people incarcerated in Georgia dropped out of high school 
and the majority of those could not read above a third grade level. She felt compelled to help. If she could encourage a child to read from kindergarten to third grade, she could possibly alter the seven out of 10 statistic. At this point, reading to schools was planned by Sandra and her staff, and off they went. A thousand schools later, she would become frustrated during her breast cancer treatment. When the doctor told her she had to rest during the day and could only visit one to two schools, not four to five schools. She would later say that if she could make learning fun, then maybe they would want to read. After leaving the Capitol, I look back and would now say she created hope in a child's mind, hope that would be the catalyst for a child to dream. Dream set a pathway for goals and commitment, which then allow achievement, all from hope. Sandra Deal lived a successful life, and she used her success to live a life of significance. I'm reminded of a budget story. Budget negotiations for the state's budget each year consisted of Terry England for the House, the late Jack Hill for the Senate, Teresa McCartney at OPB, and myself on behalf of the governor. We would negotiate, agree, and each go back respectively and brief the governor, speaker, and lieutenant governor in hopes of a final agreement. One year, Chairman Hill had decided to propose a reduction in a program that he was unaware the First Lady had taken a public stance in support. I said, I need to go back and discuss this with the First Lady since this was her request. Chairman Hill quickly receded his position of a reduction. <laughs> the next year, I had asked Ember to schedule time with both Chairman for the First Lady to go ho over her items in the governor's budget recommendation. A few days later, Chairman England Hill saw me in the hall and asked me why the First Lady was discussing a DNR bond request. <laughs> I smiled and said, Grandma's camp. <laughs> she agreed with Commissioner Mark Williams. The park is in need of new cabins. <laughs> Chairman Hill quickly said, do you think Grandma's camp would like to come to Altamaha State Park in Reedsville this summer? <laughs> Sanders Reading Schools as First Lady began to take hold across Georgia. Members of the legislature and agency heads would invite her to speak to associations, nonprofits, and civic clubs. She was quick to tell Nathan and myself she was working harder, plus having to drive, not fly. <laughs> I recall General Joe Girard, former head of Georgia's National Guard. He invited her to speak, deliver the commencement address or Gretchen Corbin. Gretchen was the Commissioner of Technical College System of Georgia. She invited her to speak at a TCSG GED graduation. Imagine 2,000 people in one arena who had earned a high school education, probably had dropped out of school only to learn the importance of a high school education and went back. This is a loud, raucous environment with air horns, cowbells, pure, raw emotion here. She gets up, starts to get a little emotional, and she said, the governor and I are so proud of you. But now what? You need to get a job. <laughs> Stay out of trouble. Raise your family and do right. You worked hard for this. Don't waste it. They absolutely loved her. She lived a life of, of significance here. As 2014, 2014 came around, I was uncertain how to use Sandra in the reelect that truly demonstrated her partnership and support for the governor, but also what she had done as first lady across Georgia. I sat with our team and we all agreed the normal was an SD. I went to my father on it for advice on how to complement the deal for governor brand by adding to it. Plus, he was the one who told me in the spring of 1992 that I was going to volunteer for Nathan Deal for Congress. That advice worked out pretty good. <laughs> he had an idea. 
re-elect Sandra Dill, First Lady of Georgia. <laughs> the team liked it. The governor liked it. SD told me to focus on Nathan, which was code for she liked it. <laughs> we went with a gut feeling. We cut an SD spot, pulling up to a school and then reading to young students and ran it the first week of early voting. Concluded the last week with Governor DeCamera. This was the best one-two combination I could think of strategically. Turns out that worked. Over the last 30 years, there are several stories that come to mind. Sandra encouraged me to keep a journal during, the, during our time in the Governor's Mansion and, and the office. I went back and pulled out a couple to share today. The Governor and First Lady of Georgia get invited to a lot of cool events. One such invitation, the President's Box at every University of Georgia football home game. Well, one year, the University of Georgia football team was doing rather well. It was a big game. But there's one problem. Sandra's not a fan of football. <laughs> it was one of those weeks where everyone and everybody was talking about the game in Athens. So I was sitting there one morning talking to her and she asked me, did Jerry Moorhead invite me to the game? I said, yes, ma'am. And I quickly followed back up. I said, but you said you do not like football. She said, Chris, if he was nice enough to invite me to the game, I'm nice enough to accept and attend. Plus, I like watching the band at halftime. <laughs> Another story I'm reminded of, Simon was sending the governor's lunch each day in a cooler the first year. The governor and I were used to going to lunch each day. So that he would swing by my office and say, want to go across the street or dock shades? The troopers, the governor, and a few of us would go to lunch. Well, our first bodyguard, Tom Willis, was eating the lunches in the cooler each day. <laughs> when the cooler went back to the mansion empty, Simon thought the governor was eating the lunch. Sandra thought the governor was eating the lunch because Simon told her the cooler was empty. It didn't take long for people to say to the first lady they saw the governor at the cafeteria or Doc Shays and for Sandra to put two and two together. You know who got in trouble? CR. <laughs> All dog got was, you know better. <laughs> but it was CR who allowed it. She knew I may not have held the governor to the same diet standards as she did. She said, and I quote, I could use the money we spend for Tom Willis to eat lunch on more prayer group lunches. <laughs> <laughs> the back cooler would eventually come to a halt. I asked Tom to stop eating any food in any cooler in the Suburban. <laughs> And I asked Teresa to provide a slight increase to the mansion food budget allocation for the prayer group lunches. <laughs> now, I would always tell the governor everything, and I would always get a smile, and he would say, she might have mentioned something about that. <laughs> Remember when the look I mentioned earlier? I got that look from her last, last Wednesday. Nathan called and said it was a good morning for me to come. He hadn't finished the sentence and I was out the office headed that way. I got a big smile. She said my hands were cold. And I reminded her she's been saying that for years. Then Katie said, what words of wisdom do you have for Chris? And there was the look. He knows. Sandra Dill lived a successful life. She was a loving sister, wife, mother, and grandmother. For eight years, she was the essence, the mother of us all in Georgia. Her ability to see good in everyone was a God-given asset that allowed her personal success to forever be remembered by a life of significance. She would often tell me the reason Jason was a good judge is because he had her belief that decisions had consequences and Nathan's squishy heart because we're still expected to love and support them. She lived a life of significance. She was the last to leave an event because she would offer to help clean up. However, if I had to pick the best quality of Sandra Dill, she always saw the best in you. No matter who you were, where you worked, she had time to take a picture, talk to you, and if you ever gave a gift of any sort, pecan, pecan pie, peaches, or even a hand-drawn picture, 
She took the time each night to write thank you notes back to me. These were not done by staff. They were done by Sandra. Sandra was a pillar of strength with the arms and hands of a mother. There have been challenges over the last 30 years, but she was always there, ready to go, standing tall, willing to do whatever that needed to be done. She would ask often about staff, their families, career paths, areas where she had seen them excel. She would encourage me to sit down with each and offer counsel and advice as to what I had seen and experienced in my career. She wanted me to accommodate new mothers by making sure they had a career but still had time with their newborn child at home. She would say, these young people have an opportunity to go on and do great things. You make sure they take advantage of this opportunity. The past three and a half years were the, were the most special. Funnier too. Everyone finally got hearing aids. <laughs> We traveled less, but our conversations centered more on former staff and grandchildren. The pride of a grandmother talking about her six grandchildren growing up and coming to visit was abundant. She was obviously someone that touched each of you here today some way or somehow. Her humility was genuine, her love was unconditional, and her willingness to take the time to meet you, talk to you, and listen to you was the only approach she knew. My challenge to each of you as we go forward, seek success in all we do, but transform our personal success into significance in our home, community, and state so others can learn and have the opportunity to become better. In closing, the past 30 years have been a true blessing. I am forever grateful to have known Sandra Dew. I, like each of you, are a better person because of it. Thank you. Everybody, let's stand up. We're going to sing I'll Fly Away. Timothy Miller is going to lead us. The words will be on the screen, but you probably don't need them. You'll be seated for just a few more minutes and I want to remind you there's only one thing standing between this moment and the prayer of dismissal. 
and that's Philip Wilhite. <laughs> so Philip, you don't, Philip doesn't need an introduction either. Everybody knows who he is, and we all appreciate you. Thank you, Philip. Thank you, Reverend Coates, and thank you, Timothy Miller. That was a rousing I'll fly away. That was great. I'll have to admit I feel a little bit like the last politician to speak at a rally. I ain't got anything left to promise y'all. So. <laughs> it's been said. It has been said so very well. But what, think about Sandra Dunnigan Deal and think about February the 1st, 1942 to August the 23rd, 2022. And there's a dash in between that. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that dash in a minute. But before that, let me, let me touch on two more items. This morning at the First Baptist Church, we had an absolutely wonderful service. And we had two wonderful speakers there and a great singer, of course, with Katie. She did a marvelous job, as, as always, like she's done today. Lee Lovett, a lifelong friend, spoke and did, a, I think, a superb job of talking about Sandra and Nathan and the relationship. And he told me as I was coming in, he said, I left out one thing I really, really wanted to say. And he told me what it was. And I said, well, I believe I can fill in that gap for you because I like what, what you're saying there. And Lee was going to talk about the four visited angels. And y'all have heard about the four visited angels that come to a home when there's time of need. And he said, we might not have had the four visited angels, but we had some awfully loving children, daughters and sons that were there. So let's give them a hand. And then Reverend uh, Bruce Morgan gave a, a, a just a, a beautiful talk, and he's Nathan is just a young Bruce Morgan. I don't know if y'all know, he never looked at a note, never looked down, never said uh, never said ah. I've never seen anything quite like it. I wish I could uh, perform like that. But he told a great story on Fanny Flag. Now I don't know how many of y'all are familiar with Fanny Flag, but Mary Hart introduced me to Fanny Flag years ago. She was an Alabama humorist, artist, and beauty queen. <laughs> And he told a story about uh, how a lady always knows when it's time to go, and it was very appropriately told about Sandra. Well, I have another story that, that Fanny Flagg told one time, and it's not quite as reverent, but uh, we seem to be having a little bit of fun now. But she was a beauty queen, and she gave some advice to other beauty queens. She said, do not sit in a wicker chair 20 minutes before the bathing suit contest. <laughs> I used to work alone, Butch, you can. <laughs> I mentioned the dash. And Mary Hart introduced me several years ago to a poem by a lady named Linda Ellis. And that dash, and you see it, if you look at your program, it's on every obituary you see in Tombstone, there's a dash. And what that dash represents, of course, is your life and what you accomplished in that life. And I think we've heard this morning and we've heard this afternoon the many, many things that Sandra Deal accomplished. That dash was not a wasted dash by any means. But let me read you one verse of that. For it matters not how much we own, the cars, the house, the cash. What matters, how, what matters is how we live and love and how we spend our dash. And I think that's something we could all think about. Let's be proud. I hope uh, when the time comes for Philip to be laid, to, laid in the ground that, that uh, People will talk about me like they did Sandra, that I have spent my dash to the best of my ability. And I think Sandra, Sandra did that. Now, I know I'm going to be a little bit redundant with some of this, being the last one, because uh, Jim Andrews and Chris and uh, Ember stole some of my lines. So, but if y'all don't mind, I'm just going to be a little bit redundant. Maybe I can put a little bit different spin on it. One thing, who noticed the sunset Tuesday evening here in North Georgia? Raise your hand. Have you ever seen a more beautiful sunset here? Sandra Deal had her hand on that. She was up there. There's no doubt that Sandra was in heaven because that sunset told it all. What I'm going to do in just a minute, I've got some quotations that I, I looked at on Facebook, Instagram, text messages to me, emails to me because I got, like so many of y'all did that were close to the deals, I got a lot of them. And I took out just sentences from them, uh, things about Sandra that, that really moved me. But the first one I read was the statement by the, by the Deal family, and I'll speak about that in just a minute. We are grieving 
but celebrate her life and the example she set. A year ago, Mary Hart and I were driving somewhere in the car and we were live streaming a funeral of a good friend of ours, David Varner, who was a doctor in Columbus, Georgia. And I know some others probably heard this too. Reverend Shane Green of the Methodist Church there used a term that I thought was perfect and I've used it when I talked about John Ferguson and, I, and it's so appropriate there and it's very appropriate today. That is celebratory grief. I think it's very fitting and right that we grieve today. We've lost a phenomenal lady with a servant's heart, which is, it's been expressed so many different ways and it's just, it's just wonderful. We need to grieve that, we've lost that. But we need to celebrate what she has accomplished. It, she touched literally, and you can't say this about a lot of people, she literally touched hundreds of thousands of lives in this state. Over 250,000 children, she touched their lives in a special way, and they all remember it. So I think celebratory grief is something that, that is very fitting today that we all need to think, think about. I have some of those same memories that Chris did uh, at the River House in April in 2009, and, and he was right on the, the be, be, tell the truth and be nice. She was looking at Chris and myself when she said that. So Nathan was exempt from that statement, but I cannot get a haircut today that I don't think about Sandra telling me to keep a haircut. And I try my best to do that, and I think uh, Chris, Chris does as well. Jim Andrews talked uh, a good bit about how his job was to get her to leave the functions. And that was also, Jim wasn't up to it. One person couldn't do it, I can assure you. So that was one of my jobs. We'd go to the function, and as, as he said, we might go four, five, six a night, and, or a day and a night. And so my job was to try to get Sandra moving towards the door at an appropriate time. You know, Sandra would come into a room, and she's going to talk to everybody there. And it's not just, hello, I'm Sandra Deal. It's, hello, Sandra Deal, who are you, where are you from? I think we're kin. That always came up. <laughs> and nine times out of ten, they were kin. Uh, so we'd go through that, and might be 100, 150 people there. Well, an hour later, it'd be time to go, and I'd go get Sandra, and I'd say, Sandra, we got to go, and she would, she would she'd just slip away from Jim. She'd pull away from me to you know, say, I'm not through because she was going to go back down the line and tell everybody goodbye and, and reaffirm their relationship, uh, kinship. So I got smarter as it went on. I'd start an hour early and say, Sandra, it's time for us to go, and we'd start the process then. And, and sometimes we'd be on time, but Chris and Denise did get a little heartburn, I know, with us being late at times. And I can't tell you how many McDonald's kids' meals, uh, Nathan, Sandra, Mary Hart, and I, Chris, Tom, who was eating out of the cooler, I find out now, I wasn't aware of that. Uh, we would have it 9 or 9.30 at night uh, because we'd go to these functions. Of course, you never had a chance to eat. You were working and Nathan was talking and Sandra was really talking. So, uh, <laughs> But one of my favorite stories about Sandra, before I go into my quotations, and y'all might have heard this because I told this on the Riverside uh, uh, video that we did just uh, several weeks ago. They had one of the meals at the mansion, Nathan and Sandra, they probably had uh, maybe 10 people there. And at the end of the meal, which was always very well done, Sandra would always offer to give a tour of the mansion. Well, that's, as usual, that night she said, let me give you all a tour of the mansion. And they said, that'd be great, we'd love to do that. And Nathan, who had seen that tour probably four or 500 times by then, said, if you don't mind, I've got some work to do. I'm just going to go upstairs and retire. She said, that'd be fine, Governor. Good to see you. So he goes upstairs, and he goes and puts on his pajamas and a robe uh, and goes and gets in his easy chair, and he's sitting up there uh, with the TV on. And about 15 minutes, he hears the elevator door open. He hears Sandra's voice, and then he hears a lot of other voices. <laughs> in they come, giving through. And here's the governor in his recliner. <laughs> enjoying one of those shoot 'em up westerns that you like uh, undoubtedly and nathan just sat there and acknowledged them as they came by and went back out but that was just sandra the governor's mansion was their house and as i've said it a thousand times and we've had nothing but wonderful first ladies present and past i tell you, i've loved them all but sandra deal was without question the most welcoming first lady this state has ever had i've never seen a thing like it i mean when you toured the 
the mansion. You you toured the mansion just like I've been on the same tour that Bill took at, at the late at the river house. So you <laughs> you see it all. But let me let me just read off. Uh, and I have a task up here. I want y'all to know that too about a foundation. I'm gonna get that in just a minute. But let me read some quotations from people. And this is just typical of what has been said. These are all ages, types, denominations, you name it. This is a cross section of the demographics of this state of people that I have, that I got messages from, that I saw on Facebook, and they're just one line, one line. Uh, and if you recognize your line, because some of y'all are here, just raise your hand. Uh, she made the world a better place. Tuesday night was one of the most beautiful sunsets in Gainesville ever, and it was the day we lost an angel. No coincidence, Sandra is home now, and she blessed us with this amazing show. Mrs. Deal was the epitome of kindness and grace. A beautiful person with a, cra a gracious, caring heart and always with a loving smile. Love that smile. Knowing and loving Sandra Deal was the privilege of a lifetime. Mrs. Sandra Deal represented the best of all of us because she truly enjoyed educating children and had an unrivaled passion for helping others learn to read. Good or bad, she loved us all. Our first lady was first class. She left such a lasting imprint on the many lives she touched. I think Ember and her beautiful group of ladies kind of exemplify that. The best first lady George has ever had will always be remembered as the heart and soul of Georgia and an awesome partner and inspiration to Nathan. A great lady with a heart for service and future generations. She was just the best ever. Sandra was my all-time favorite first lady. Sandra was the source for inspiration and greatness. Mrs. Deal will always be the bright star of my life. She changed my life. She molded me, taught me, and loved me. Sandra challenged me and championed me. Mrs. Deal was like a mother, a teacher, a grandmother, a mentor, and a friend, all in one and a friend like no other. And I think that's from probably 40 different people that have, that she touched in that way and there are tens of thousands more out there that have that same feeling towards her. But let me tell you why I'm here and those of you that know me know that this is no surprise. I want to talk, talk to y'all a little bit about the J. Nathan and Sandra Deal Foundation. It will serve to educate, elevate Georgia, with a servant's heart. The Deal family and myself and, and others such as Ember Bentley, Chris Riley, met last uh, two days ago, Thursday, at the River House and, and we kind of laid the groundwork for what we wanted to do here. And during the meeting, the one question that was asked over and over is what would Sandra do? What would Sandra want? And that's the basis of this entire foundation. During her many years of teaching, you've heard this said by others, and her eight years as First Lady traveling around our great state, reading to children, she was firm in her belief, firm in her belief, that you had to make learning fun for kids, and she did just that. The Deal Foundation has a lot of great ideas that will evolve over the next several years, but some of the initial thoughts they have are, and we're welcome to other thoughts people might have, support and promote the creation publication and distribution of children's books that are written by Georgia authors, illustrated by Georgia artists, and published by Georgia publishers such as Mercer Press, the UGA Press, and others. With that in mind, the first book uh, which I had read to me by its author just last Thursday will be, the name of it is, The Governor's Cat. Who do you think wrote that? You're right, Governor Nathan Deal read it to me on Thursday, and it is phenomenal. It really is. I don't know if it's going to make the New York Times bestseller list, but it ought to. Uh, and we're going to get it illustrated by some family members and some other Georgia artists, and we're going to get it published. And I'm, I'm, it's, it's really an amazing story about the cat Vito, and those of you in the room can understand the term Vito with the governor. And I'm happy to say that Vito was alive and well and living the good life on the Chattahoochee River as we speak. I, 
I was with Vito on Thursday and he looked very content and happy. The completion of this book was a promise that Nathan made to Sandra before she passed away and he read it to her and, and he got her thumbs up on it, correct? Correct. He plans to write a book a year, a children's book a year, and I can assure you I'm already looking forward to the next one already because the first one really is you're going to enjoy reading it. It's got so many life's lessons in it. Uh, it's fun. It's a fun read and it's going to be great for children. Another great idea that we had was to have a seminar of K through third grade teachers, maybe have the Lanier Islands or someplace, and bring them together to find out what they are doing in their classrooms to make learning fun for their children. Because a, a two year, uh, excuse me, a, a second grader in Hay Hara is the same second grader that's in Hawassi or Glen County. And let's find out what's working all over this state to make learning fun. And let's come up with best practices that we can overlay across the state. And I know Governor Kemp and Governor Purdue are both keen on education. I know y'all will buy into that. It's, I think it's a, just a wonderful idea. Another, another idea was we have the, at the 4-H uh, in Jekyll Island, the Sandra Deal Learning Center. Maybe have some scholarships to kids to go to that each year. Uh, which I think will be a, a, a real godsend to those kids. We will promote and encourage the Sandra, Sandra Deal Read Across Georgia Month and tie this in with creative writing as those two things go hand in hand. 100% of these pro proceeds will be applied to literacy programs that Nathan and Sandra have promoted and espoused their entire lives. Please join with the Wilhite family and others to help make this a reality. And we hope this, if this will become a, a part of your annual uh, philanthropy each and every year, and not, not a one and done. We need to promote this to keep it going. It'll help, it'll help so many areas of our state. The Northeast Georgia Community Foundation will be managing these funds for us, and this will, of course, add accountability and, and management of these funds. The Deal Foundation Board which is still being formed, will make the decisions with what programs we will we'll fund. And of course, this will grow each year as the endowment grows. And let me assure you, no gift is too small, nor is no gift too large. Let me really emphasize that. Uh, Eddie Staub taught me and others years ago that you love the giver, not the gift. So if it's $10, we love it. If it's $10,000, we love it just the same. So please think about that. We have a QR code that's on tables in the back of the room. For those of you my age that might not know what a QR code is, there it is. All you have to do with your iPhone is take a picture of that and it'll connect you immediately to the Northeast Georgia Community Foundation where you can make a donation. And you might not be prepared to do that today and we understand that. Uh, but take it home with you, think about it, talk to your wife, Pray about it, and, and let's see if this isn't something that will fit in everybody's philanthropic giving. Because this is truly, in my mind, a gift that, that keeps on giving. Generation after generation, these type of programs will change lives and help others break that, that chain of poverty, that cycle of poverty, and move our great state forward so we can continue, as we have under these three great governors, to be the best state in the nation to live, play, and do business. I think that's important. So thank y'all for that consideration. If you have any questions, please see me or Chris. Uh, after this, we'll be glad to explain, or Ember. Ember has kind of been the one of the real impetus behind this whole program. And I'm gonna close with one thing in this, and uh, Ember was kind enough not to use herself. I, I read Ember's, uh, Bentley's uh, statement on Facebook I hate to use for a state, but that's not her her eulogy. Her her she bared her soul about Sandra, and this was the last paragraph of it. And this one I'm gonna close with: We honor Sandra with our attitude, our compassion, and our commitment as we set out each day to live out the legacy she leaves in all of us, lucky enough to have known her and be blessed by her. Go rest high on the mountain, Sandra. Our good and faithful servant, you've earned it. We love you dearly. Thank you so much for being here. Coach. All right, we're going to stand together and have our benediction. 
And then we're going to listen one more time to the wonderful voice of Timothy Miller. And then we're through. And afterwards, if you want to speak to the Deal family, they'll be here for a few more moments. Some of you maybe have not had the opportunity yet. Take advantage of it now. Let us pray. O oh Lord, as the shadows lengthen on all of our lives, we realize that the dash really does matter. How we live between the time we've come here and the time we leave. I pray that following the inspiration of Sandra Deal, we will live lives of enthusiasm and passion and deep faith and that we will make the world a better place as she did. Bless the family of Sandra Deal and the community and the state that she loved. Now we go from this place led by your Spirit to do good. In Christ we pray. Amen. I can hurt.